Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an independent educational grant from Lilly. Hello and welcome to the session on navigating patient-centered care of CLL and mantle cell lymphoma. This is about empowering collaboration and communication. My name is John Gribben. I'm Professor of Medical Oncology at the Barts Cancer Institute, Queen Mary University of London in the UK. Welcome to this program, I've already told you, Navigating Patient-Centered Care of CLL and Mantle Cell Lymphoma, Empowering Collaboration and Communication. In this program, our goal is to make sure we're focusing on the patients. We want to bring in their perspectives and make sure our communication with them is top-notch. By doing this, we're helping healthcare professionals make a difference in the lives of patients dealing with relapsed refractory CLL and relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma. It's all about getting everyone on the same page and working together to achieve the best outcomes possible. So what we've got planned here are several chapters that break down the treatment scene for CLL and mantle cell lymphoma. We're going really deep into what it's like for patients dealing with these blood cancers and figuring out the best ways to talk to them along their journey. It's all about making sure we're not just focusing on the medical side of things, but also on how our patients are feeling and coping throughout their treatment. Now, I'm not doing this alone, so let me introduce our multidisciplinary faculty. Jennifer Wilson is a social worker working for the Information Resource Centre of the Leukaemia and Lymphoma Society. Dame Leslie Fallowfield, for those of us who work in this area, knows needs no introduction, but she's Professor of Psycho-Oncology and is the Director of the organisation called Sussex Health Outcomes Research and Education in Cancer. And that, last but not least, uh, Josie Montegard, who's a nurse practitioner at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, my old institute, where I had the pleasure for working for almost 20 years. So, Josie, very good to have you on board. So please continue on to the next chapter where Jennifer Wilson will outline what it's like to live with a diagnosis of these B-cell malignancies. Hello, my name is Jennifer Wilson and as introduced by John, I'm a social worker at the Information Resource Center at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Welcome to this chapter entitled Living with CLL and MCL Through the Eyes of the Patient. So there is a tremendous impact of the diagnosis and the fear of relapse that many patients report living with. The lived experience of CLL and MCL patients often includes the anticipatory fear of relapse. When the relapse does occur, it's not only about what's the next line of treatment, but it's the broader implications of how this will affect the patient and their family and their lives. And so, there needs to be some way to balance the life events with the medical necessity. There's never going to be a good time for a relapse. But through open communication, patients can come to an understanding of how to balance life events with medical necessity. Patients may have weddings, something at work, a trip that's been planned. And so they want to be able to have those experiences. But it really comes down to, is it safe to delay treatment? And even if the ultimate answer is, we need to start treatment now, I think the fact that there was a communication and a conversation about what the patient ideally would have liked is really important and makes people feel like their life experience truly matters. The doctor may have one set of goals, the patient has another set of goals. And so it's really about, again, communicating and coming together so that they can come up with a plan that is both medically sound, but reasonable to the patient. So it can be quite helpful. 
if the doctor has reviewed the pros and the cons, and that way the patient is aware of all the treatment options. However, sometimes patients enter into the appointment and they have a very specific uh, treatment goal. They want a fixed duration treatment or they want the treatment that will be least disruptive to their lives. And so by knowing all the treatment options and their preference, hopefully they can come to a place of a mutually agreed upon next step. But through this all, patients really have a fear of running out of treatment options. And the best way to combat this fear is by education. Education that starts right at the beginning about the treatment landscape and how it's evolving and new combinations and treatments that are being explored, different treatment modalities. And so a particular importance is that patients are educated about clinical trials, dispelling the myths, and by explaining that clinical trials may be a reasonable option at any phase of the disease. Because what can happen is, if a clinical trial is offered after several lines of treatment, patients may interpret that, that this is a last resort. And that may not be the case at all, that might be what they conclude, and they're scared to ask. And so if they know in advance, yeah, I'm going to let you know all your options, that gives them the opportunity to hear about the clinical trial and have it be an, a reasonable option for them. So as patients may be concerned about decreasing number of options available for treatment, they may feel that it's imperative that they stay on the treatment they're currently on. And so the way they may do that is by not reporting possible treatment related side effects to their treatment team. Because if they think, if I report this, then they're gonna discontinue the treatment. Now, a lot of times that's not the case at all, but it needs to be out on the table. You know what? Report, this, report the side effects. This will allow us to manage those treatment-related side effects, which can help prevent treatment disruption or treatment discontinuation. So it's an opportunity to intervene early. It's important that patients have a list or some clarification about which side effects need immediate attention and guidance on managing common side effects. And patients all need to be empowered to ask for clarification and to report how they're doing to their treatment team. And so we want to bring in a collaborative approach where shared decision making can be used. And part of that is communicating what the patient's needs are. And so part of it might be that the patient has questions about the efficacy of the proposed treatment or possible side effects, or expressing their fears about relapse or running out of treatments. Those are all really important to be communicated. And then there's the matter of practical, practical things, financial concerns. Will the patient be able to get to the scheduled appointments? Will they take the medication they're given at home? Do they have the means or the funds to travel to and from the treatment center as needed? So by putting all of these concerns out and by asking about them, it gives the opportunity for the treatment team to know what's going on through the patient's head and allows them to come up with resources to address those concerns. Supportive care. So patients, this is a really difficult period for many patients, and it's so important to connect patients to the full multidisciplinary team. Not just, you know, the doctor and the PA, but it's also about the whole nursing staff, about the social worker, the financial counselor. All of these people together can help work to help the patient through this very difficult time. And then 
we look for psychosocial support because this is so hard. And some people would like counseling. Other people just want education. Some people feel like spiritual support can be helpful to them. We're going to support groups. It really has to be individualized of what's best for them. But it has to be just put out there so that the patients are aware that these supports exist. Because, you know, just having them isn't enough. Patients may not know where to look or they might be too embarrassed to ask. So having that put out there, here's what we've got, here's where you can go, really can be quite helpful. And we know that by managing the financial and psychosocial health can truly impact treatment outcomes. Thank you for watching. Please continue to the next chapter where John Gribben will provide an overview of the current management of relapsed and refractory CLL and MCL. Hello and welcome to this chapter entitled, Where Are We Today with Treating Relapse Refractory CLL and Relapse Refractory Mantle Cell Lymphoma? Well, in CLL at least, we've moved almost completely now from the field of, of chemotherapy. Uh, and certainly in my career, we've gone through a whole iteration of how we treat this disease. And I'm very excited to say that CLL has become a paradigm disease now for how we're looking at targeted therapies in this disease. We've got the covalent BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and zanabrutinib currently approved, BCL2 inhibitor, venetoclax, the non-covalent BTK inhibitor, pertubrutinib, and of course, right on the horizon, the CAR T ther therapy with lysocaps gene meruloso. The NCCN guidelines look at the treatment of CLL um, in terms of looking at second or subsequent therapies. Uh, on the basis of whether or not there's a 17P deletion or a TP53 mutation. Now, an important feature in CLL is this is not a fixed um, uh, mutation. Uh, it can be acquired, and it's very important as patients relapse to retest for the presence of either a 17P deletion or P53 mutation. The second or subsequent therapy is always going to depend on what therapy was used first. And since we don't have necessarily a preferred frontline therapy, there's no obvious second line preferred therapy in this circumstances. It depends entirely on how you first treated the patients, how they responded, and what are the circumstances of why they relapsed and became refractory. But certainly you can see that these targeted therapies become the treatment of choice. A group of patients in whom we're struggling to know exactly what to do quite often, and we've had fewer choices until recently, are those groups of patients who've failed a prior BTK inhibitor as well as venetoclase-based regimens. And you'll see here that there are recommended regimens here that include things like CAR T cells. Now, these are often the groups of patients in whom clinical trials are necessarily going to be our treatment of choice. In those patients with 17P deletions, I have to say there's probably less of a difference now than there used to be when we were using chemotherapy, where we wanted, of course, under all circumstances, to avoid chemotherapy in this setting. But you'll see that, again, our, our second or third line therapies are very much those same therapies we're using before, that is, the BTK inhibitors, venetoclax. And, of course, again, irrespective of whether they have a 17P deletion or not, what happens when they've failed both lines of therapy, we're running into fewer and fewer options that are really good options for our patients. Now, the ESMO guidelines are a little bit out of date. Barbara Eichhorst, I know, is already updating these guidelines, and we'll see them again very soon. But here you'll see that they're still talking about the length of duration of first therapy, and largely because in that time when these guidelines were coming out, the frontline therapy often still remained chemotherapy, and that's becoming less and less of an issue now. But what you'll see is, again, along the bottom, a whole variety of targeted therapies which are our treatments of choice. So what have we learned about relapse refractory CLL? Well, we certainly know that patients who progress after a covalent BTK inhibitor, we can switch to a venetoclax-based regimen, or we can switch to a non-covalent BTK inhibitor like pertubrutinib. We're fortunate now in that a large number of patients used to become not progressing through a BTK inhibitor, becoming intolerant. And now that we have a whole variety of different BTK inhibitors we can use, we could switch to a different covalent BTK inhibitor, switching from a brutinib to a calibrutinib or zanabrutinib or vice versa. 
Progression after frontline venetoclax and abinutuzumab, you could move to a venetoclax-based retreatment if the patient's had a long duration of remission. And usually we mean by that more than two years of therapy. Or we could move to a covalent BTK inhibitor, particularly if they've had a short remission. Our options for third line and beyond, for, for those of you in the USA, of course, there's the pertobrutinib. There may well be access to the CAR T-cell therapy, uh, lysocaptogene meruluso. And, of course, there are other therapies, um, PI3 kinase inhibitors, therapies in clinical development, and, of course, the bispecific antibodies are becoming a very attractive proposition in the clinical trial setting in these diseases. So what about mantle cell lymphoma? Well, we're still often using uh, chemoimmunotherapy and frontline therapy, often with either an autologous stem cell transplant or even um, a monoclonal antibody maintenance therapy. With second-line therapy, our preferred regimens are usually the BTK inhibitors, depending on where you're living and working. It can be a calibrutinib, xanabrutinib, or ibrutinib. Um, we can use uh, continuous inhibitors, um, uh, and we can often use the inhibitors with or without um, anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. The whole variety of circumstances that can be used uh, under certain circumstances, including, of course, a whole variety of chemotherapy regimens. But again, we're looking nowadays to be moving from chemotherapy to BTK inhibitors. And for me, our preferred th third-line therapy for a suitable patient would be CAR T-cell therapy using here brexacaptogene autoluso. Now, the ESMO MCL guidelines were last updated in 2017 and really I'm afraid pretty much out of date at the moment, but the good news is they are being revised and update is pending. Now, there are differences in the approval status of BTK inhibitors and CAR T cell therapies in the EU and the United States, and that's shown here uh, just to highlight differences that exist that based upon the current approval process of where things are. So what have we learned in relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma? Well, progression after frontline therapy, our preferred therapy now would be covalent BTK inhibitors. Progression on two prior lines of therapy, including a BTK inhibitor, we could certainly consider pertobrutinib. I've already mentioned the CAR T cell with brexacaptogene autoluso. And of course, you have a choice based on the disease, the treatment, and of course, as we're going to talk much more about today, patient-related factors. Again, other options in clinical development, a lot of interest in bispecific antibodies. There are other CAR T cells appearing on the horizon, non-covalent BTK inhibitors I've already mentioned, as well as BTK degraders. So I think I'd summarize by saying that selecting a treatment should be nowadays a shared decision-making process involving both the clinicians and the patients and all the caregivers in the multidisciplinary team. I already mentioned there are disease, treatment, and patient-related factors. The most notable one, of course, being what the patient's prior therapy has been. We have to think about what patients can afford nowadays, even the copay for many of these uh, therapies who, for patients who have approval or who have insurance for these agents can often be quite expensive. We have to think about the mutational status and the karyotype of the disease in terms of thinking what's the optimal therapy. And of course, we have to think about the toxicities because this is a hugely important factor in terms of the quality of life. In terms of our patient-related factors, I'd like to think nowadays I'm getting to the, the, my own age where age shouldn't be a factor. I like to think more of the fitness of the patients and their comorbidities. The family circumstances can be important. Personal preferences, for instance, I've already mentioned fixed line versus uh, um, limited. Uh, purely oral agents or, of course, using uh, intravenous uh, therapy are often factors which uh, uh, factor in enormously into what are the optimal treatment that patients may want. So with that, thank you for watching and please continue to the next chapter where Leslie Fallowfield will discuss the importance of shared decision making and self-advocacy. Thanks very much, John, for that uh, really interesting introduction to the treatment. As you introduced me earlier, I'm a psycho-oncologist and I'm director of um, Sussex Health Outcomes Research and Education in Cancer at the University of Sussex, Brighton and Sussex Medical School. John's already alluded to some of the issues that are really important, but I'm going to try and focus on how to empower shared decision making and self advocacy more uh, effectively. 
So over the last decade, I guess, decision making and patient-centered care has become more um, apparent. There are lots of ethical, legal, and social imperatives as to why we should engage in more collaborative decision-making with patients and shift much more towards this patient-centered care. Now, we know from lots of studies that have been done worldwide, really, that patients generally want much more information and more overtly collaborative participation. But I'm going to discuss a little bit more about that later on. If you do manage to really uh, adhere to the preferences of your patient in terms of how much decision making they want to do, how much information they want, there are lots of potential benefits you will usually reduce their fear and anxiety because uncertainty does make people very anxious and there's a lot of uncertainty with many hematological cancers. Um, patients who've actually been invited to join in more collaboratively actually experience less decisional regret about the options that they choose. They, generally speaking, also have an enhanced ability to employ more effective coping strategies to deal with whatever lies ahead. They generally uh, adhere better to advice as well as the management plans and consequently have an improved quality of life. Now, let's look at the basic decision making preferences of patients. I've really sort of praised this, but essentially you can look at patients um, fitting into three different categories. There's the more passive patient. The doctor makes the decision for me. There's the shared or collaborative approach where the doctor recommends treatment, taking account of my views. And then there's the active patient, someone who'd be a nightmare like me, who would want the doctor to give me lots of information, but I would be the one that made the final decision. And people will waver um, amongst those categories, but most studies show that the majority really want that middle bit, the shared or collaborative decision making. More active participation tends to be associated with higher educated patients and those who are younger. And obviously, many of our CLL patients are slightly older. But I don't think you should always take that as the uh, reason for basing how you're going to pitch things to patients ask them how much information they want and how much they want to be involved in making decisions. Now, which of all those options is best? There's a general assumption that a shared approach is best, but this is a value-laden assumption in itself because the relationship between a doctor and a patient is never going to be symmetrical in these decisions. It's sometimes really pretty hard for the sick and quite anxious patient to convey their values, their lifestyle and preferences unless the doctor actively probes. So if you haven't probed where a patient's coming from, some of the decisions that they might make may seem quite irrational. The other problem is that obviously healthcare professionals have lots of power through knowledge. And at the end of the day, it's not us who have to actually experience the consequences of the treatment recommendations. And I think something that's really important to tackle here is that it's not always easy to share decisions if the doctor has a very clear view as to what scientifically might be in the best interests of the patient. So how can we enhance patient-centered decision-making? Well, obviously, it's giving plenty of information um, in an appropriate manner. I mean, I think particularly, again, with hematological cancers, the volume of information is huge. Also, many of the concepts surrounding treatment are not very sort of familiar to patients who might know someone who's had a common solid tumour. Even pronunciation of many of the words is pretty uh, challenging for most of us. But we need to be sure that the patient understands the therapeutic intent, 
that they've been given as much information about the available options, and importantly, um, what's involved in terms of treatment regimens? How many visits um, patients are going to have to make? How much screening and monitoring is required from the different options, as well as all the associated risk harms and likely benefits? And I think during all this, incorporating a patient's own sort of values and preferences is not not always easy. So if we look at what the overall goals of patients are and how we help them understand treatment options, as alluded to earlier, patients are individuals and must be treated as such. I often think that we know more about the intricacies of the tumor cells or cancer cells that patients have than we ever do about the whole patient's that has these. Um, but when we're giving information, it's really vital to recognize that health literacy and numeracy skills not only differ and will therefore affect understanding of the disease and treatment and um, uh, management options that you're talking about, but also that we tend to severely overestimate how literate and numerous um, our patients are. Even well-educated patients have quite a lot of difficulty in understanding percentages and proportions and the sorts of things that might excite a clinical scientist in terms of benefits are not things that necessarily will resonate with a patient. Now, the other thing that I think is vital here, obviously, treatment of CLL and mantle cell um, uh, disease it will require a whole team. And all members of the multidisciplinary team have to be on message because consistency of information giving is absolutely vital. If members of the care team offer differing opinions, this of course is going to confuse patients hugely, further produce um, uncertainty and inhibit a patient's ability to make a decision. And I think it's really quite useful for the MDT members to periodically check what information they're giving out to patients um, to ensure concordance of the message. Now, just to finish up, I'd like to mention something that I've uh, described as the DREAM protocol, which I think can aid communication and a genuine two-way exchange. So the first uh, part of the DREAM is D for data. Obviously, you as a healthcare professional need to give out um, appropriate data to the patient, but you've also got to collect accurate data, um, clear history taking and personal preferences, lifestyle um, views of the patient. Um, and this requires good preparation and uh, a willingness to allow for appropriate time. Now, you're going to actually get better data from your patient about not only their disease, but how treatment is working if the relationship is good. So establishing good rapport, a good relationship will require awareness of not only your verbal, but also your nonverbal communication and lots of engagement in active listening of what the patient is saying. We do an awful lot of communication with our computers rather than the patients these days. Now, obviously, when somebody has a life-threatening disease, empathic responses to the patient's point of view, acknowledging the burden of disease and treatment is important. I think sometimes everyone becomes rather inured to the sorts of burdens that patients are going to experience um, but, and therefore maybe forget to just mention to each individual patient how you recognize the difficulties that certain management um, uh, sort of suggestions are going to involve. Then there's advice, sharing advice, explaining the rationale and logic for the treatment recommendations always simplifying complex information, but um, doing so in a way that's not patronizing. Um, I always like to talk about chunking information and then checking after each of these chunks that the patient has understood that bit before moving on. 
And then the final part of the dream is motivation. It actually does take quite a lot of effort for some patients to go through treatment. And I think providing an encouraging motivation about what is likely to happen if they can get through things, discussing again realistic um, goals that are achievable is really important. So decision making is not a discrete decision. It's a process that will occur over time and it'll involve many other members of the healthcare team. Healthcare professionals do have a really powerful influence on patients' choices, but they're not the only source. And trust that the doctor knows best still has some resonance for certain types of patients. The clinical parameters that provide us with a rationale and logic about treatment options aren't always as salient to the patient as healthcare professionals might think. And I think providing them with data about the side effects that will impact quality of life, the burdens, the hospital visits for scans and monitoring and so forth, these aren't always easily av available or factored into the decision making that a patient will make. So I hope that that's been helpful. Thank you for listening. And I think it's now a really good opportunity for all of us to come together and have a panel discussion about collaboration and communication with patients and the multidisciplinary team. So let's think about putting this into practice and think about collaboration and communication with patients and the multidisciplinary team. What I'd like to talk about here is the role, the special role that nurses and nurse practitioners have. So, Josie, do you want to just introduce yourself here and then we can start to talk about your role? Sure, and thanks for having me. So I'm a nurse practitioner at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm really happy to be here and represent nurse practitioners and nurses because I think we have such a unique and integral part of the patient and provider care team. I almost think of myself as a liaison between the physician and the patient, because while on the physician side, I have um, the similar clinical expertise and can really provide education to the patient on the disease state and their treatment and side effects, I also tend to be the person that the a patient primarily communicates with. So I'm seeing them more often in clinic for their regular visits. I'm the one who's answering their calls or messages into the institute to discuss their side effects or concerns. So I feel like I am able to filter all the information coming from the medical side as well as the patient side in figuring out how the patient's doing, what are their goals, and um, how, are, how are they able to um, manage their emotional and coping skills in order to progress through their treatment, or if they're still on observation, how they're managing um, emotionally in that state. I think that's great. You're kind of covering lots of the aspects of the dream approach that, um, that Leslie talked about. I, I've always personally as a physician found it rather disappointing in some respects that um, that patients uh, often prefer to talk to the nurse practitioner about many of these issues rather than to the physician. But I think, Leslie, you brought in this uh, of, of, of lack of symmetry with uh, the patients and, and the physicians. And sometimes maybe we just seem that a little bit far away. There's also that kind of feeling that many of the patients want to try to... Um, you know, appear as good patients to the doctor, but somehow or other are able to break down those barriers a little bit easier with the, the nurses. Yeah, there's lots of issues there, John, actually, um, that are quite interesting to explore. First of all, all healthcare professionals are as different as their patients. So one of the problems we face is that there are sort of almost stereotypical, um, if you like, ideas about what are the sorts of things you tell the doctor and what are the sorts of things you tell the nice nurse. And um, 
people adhere to some of those stereotypes. They have expectations that the doctor perhaps will give them, you know, the clinical sort of outline of things, and then the nurse will explain it. And indeed, I sometimes hear doctors say, you probably haven't actually um, taken in half of what I've been saying, but the nurse will talk to you about it later. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We need a much more collaborative approach between healthcare professionals. A good team works well. But I think sometimes these stereotypes almost sort of you prime the patient to expect that they'll ask the nurse more questions and different ones from that of the doctor. So, see, another thing I want to pick up with you is, of course, nowadays we're often going on um, on oral therapies and um, and often, of course, with a BTK inhibitor, it can be continuous therapy very long term. And we know very well the data on uh, adherence. And, um, and of course, many of these agents um, do have, you know, good side effect profiles, but even minor side effects, which given over a long period of time can be very, very disruptive for our patients. How, how do you kind of deal with kind of raising these issues and helping patients adhere to these kind of regimens? Yeah, so I think you name a number of issues and that we have in managing patients in the modern day era of CLL and mantle cell lymphoma treatment. And uh, I think a priority for me is always um, developing transparency with the patient right from the beginning. So making them feel comfortable enough that they can disclose to me if they're missing doses or they cannot pay for treatment, um, I think that helps them be transparent and be open and honest so that we can then address any issues that are coming up. I also think that I really prioritize setting expectations of the goals of treatment right in the beginning of the treatment discussion. So particularly with BTK inhibitors, I find that my when my patients start on them, they are very adherent. Um, you know, they know this is treating their cancer and that um, really their outcomes can uh, depend on them taking their medications properly. But once the patient's two or three years into treatment and you know their blood counts look fine and they're feeling much better from a, for instance, CLL standpoint, and they're starting to develop those more nagging side effects, that's when they start questioning, do I really need to be on this treatment indefinitely? Um, couldn't I just stop and, you know, pick it back up when the CLL becomes an issue again. And um, I think that's when both myself and my physicians uh, step in and re-educate them on, on the goal of treatment and, and um, educate them on how BTK inhibitors work and the fact that they do allow patients to get into um, clinical remissions, but that the CLL is still present. And sometimes that little extra information is enough to um, revitalize the patient in uh, being a little bit more adherent with their medication. We tend to try to open the conversation more with how many doses have you missed with the assumption that everyone is human um, and that missed doses, even for the most adherent patients, are going to happen. And I think that allows them to slide into the conversation a little bit easier than have you missed any, which sounds a bit more accusatory. Great, great thought. Um, Leslie, you talked a lot about um, exploring, you know, the treatment and the goals of what the patients were looking to achieve in terms of how we can communicate with our patients about treatment options and, and how that empowers that decision making um, process. Um, maybe we could all together think about the um, the ways in which we can maximise our ability to, to do this. Yes, I mean, you know, sort of... <laughs> I guess there's an assumption, isn't there, that everybody just wants to extend their life, full stop, that that's the primary goal of everybody, rather than actually improve the quality of their mm. life. Mm. And um, I think if one only focuses on quantity rather than quality, you are going to get some sort of 
unexpected sort of uh, decisions made by patients. Um, sometimes the sorts of things that will excite the clinical scientist at an ASH conference, seeing the progression-free survival benefits, the you know small benefits of new treatments, might mean nothing to a patient who is so crippled with diarrhea that they can't go out anymore, do anything that makes life sort of um, worth living for them. So I think you know, we really do need to work a little harder at what a patient really views as the primary objective for them. Difficult conversations to have. I guess also, and in terms of what Josie, you were saying also, is that that might change along the treatment uh, algorithm. So uh, patients' initial goal of what they were looking to achieve when they first started the therapy may, may alter as that therapy progresses. Um, and uh, that's, uh, uh, therefore, an ongoing conversation we should perhaps be having by, with people, right? Yeah, I'm, I completely agree that the conversation needs to be ongoing, um, you know, and I think we never know what side effect is going to really become problematic for a patient. You know, when if, again, for instance, when I think of our BTK inhibitors, there is a whole laundry list of side effects that can happen. And, you know, even with the ones that we frequently see happen, the severity of them uh, for patient to patient is very different. Um, you know, we have patients that only have mild aches and pains to patients that have been fully debilitated physically from the arthralgias that come with them. And so while some Someone may have chosen that treatment because we've advertised, you know, pretty um, manageable side effects with supportive care and low um, low maintenance clinic visit schedule and whatnot. If they then are experiencing that severe side effect, I think we need to revisit that conversation and not forget that um, the quality of life of the patient may not be what they expected it to be at the time they made their original decision. Now, of course, patients nowadays have various different ways in which they can uh, access information. And of course, Jennifer, um, societies like your own provide a great deal of information, both in terms of before the treatment decisions are made, but also in terms of supporting patients. How, um, how do you think um, the, the patient advocacy groups and the, and the societies can kind of enhance this, this process of, of sharing information and providing the same, if you like, information in, in different ways that makes it more accessible to, to everyone? I mean, I know one of the things that I do um, is I first ask what they've heard from their treatment team, from the doctor, from their nurse, so that I understand what where they're entering the conversation. They may have questions that they haven't asked their doctor, or mm. we may work together to come up with some questions that they can bring back to the treatment team to help them formulate those questions and get what they need. You know, sometimes someone might have a side effect from one BTK inhibitor, and they're unaware that perhaps there might be a slightly different side effect profile to another one and that they just need to ask those questions. And so I think that's part of the process. And also, I spend time just coming up with ways to try to help them um, take the medication as prescribed, if at all possible. If, if not, then... I get I try to really encourage going right back to the healthcare team so that they're not going weeks saying, Well, I'm going next month. No, we're gonna why don't you call them up and let them know what you're experiencing so that they can try to help you with this. Yeah, sure. And I think we all know the reason for this is so important is there's very clear data about the success, particularly of the continuous therapy with BTK inhibitors, that patients mm -hmm. really need to stay on the drug for a long period of time to get the maximal benefit. And it's all about how can we help our patients to stay on that therapy at the, the best dose that we can. Now, the best dose that they can not, might not necessarily always be the optimal dose that's recommended for all patients, and we have to remember that also. 
But I think well, patients yeah. also don't report side effects at times because they fear the doctor is going to say, okay, we're, you know, we'll stop this treatment. And then they feel they'll have one less treatment to use. And so they, instead of getting help and getting some of the supportive care that might make a difference, they sort of bypass it by just being quiet about it. I think, Jennifer, that's an absolutely very valid point. And a lot of my patients have told me when you eventually get to say, is that, oh, I thought if I'd mentioned this, you would have taken me off the drug and I wanted to try to stay on it for longer. Um, of course, it's the very opposite of what I think Josie and I have been talking about, how we would be spending our time talking to our patients about how we're there to try to help them being on it. But uh, I think, Leslie, you also said it. What we say and what the patient hears are often very, very different things. Oh, absolutely. I mean, because I think the best doctors and nurses in the world can't help but after a while become completely inured to the terminology, the concepts that, you know, the particular area that they work in. Um, it's just everyday practice. And you don't realise very often that you've slipped into certain sorts of, of, of jargon that has been incomprehensible to the patient. But again, the good patient sort of uh, uh, phenomenon occurs where you don't really want want to admit that you haven't understood because it's suggesting that the doctor hasn't been clear. And when we um, record interviews between doctors and patients, and then we actually ask the uh, doctor whether he or she felt that the patient had understood things, they'll probably say, oh, yes, didn't have many questions. And then we'll ask the patient to tell us what the doctor said. And what you see happens is that patients tend to recall the first thing that was said, the last thing that was said, and then they confabulate everything that happened in the middle, which can often be the most important bits. It's called effort after meaning. So it's why when we ask friends or colleagues, what did the doctor tell you? And they tell you and you think, no doctor in their right mind would have ever said that. And remember, there's always a simpler way of saying something, no matter how complex. We are talking here about relapsed and refractory uh, diseases, which, of course, uh, means, of course, that the disease has, you know, progressed uh, in, the, in, in these patients. Now, so these are challenging conversations with the patients in terms of disease progression. Um, it's difficult giving the patient the original diagnosis, but then telling them their therapy has progressed and they're no longer responding to therapy. Um, Leslie, how uh, how do you find uh, uh, in your experience is, is the best way to kind of challenge, you know, uh, raise these issues with with patients? Because often, of course, in these disease settings, we've got time. We can see early signs of progression long before we may need to do anything about it. Oh, I mean, this is, I wish I had some sort of magic way of uh, making this an easy sort of discussion. It isn't. But I do think it's important that at the outset, um, one does actually try and manage people's expectations and think a bit about the personality predispositions of the patient in front of you. Because there are some patients who are always going to have um, excessive optimism bias about everything you say. You know, I'm always the lucky one who picks the raffle tickets out or the lottery numbers for somebody versus the eternal pessimist who will start actually expecting, you know, um, that the disease will progress. I think one has to manage expectations, be realistically optimistic about the sorts of times that actually the patient might go into remission, um, but prepare them for relapse and the inevitable um, for most patients. Honesty accompanied by um, as much reassurance as one feels is appropriate, I think is the only way we can do this. I think you raised one very interesting issue repeatedly. Um, we've all been talking about it. That is this ongoing dialogue. And of course, 
I certainly spend a lot of time talking to patients um, that new treatments have become available, that there are going to be options if, you know, the treatment they're on either fails or they're no able, not able to tolerate it anymore. Josie, you'll know also that that's quite difficult to do sometimes when you've only got a set time in clinic and you've got to get through and you've got a line of people sitting outside. But Actively listening, of course, is, is a, a big thing about what we've been talking about here the whole way through and making sure we're picking up all the clues from our patients of the things they want to try to tell us. As a, as a, as a nurse and as a practitioner, what's, what are the kind of the tricks you use to try to kind of be able to actively listen but move the conversation on at the same time, if that makes sense? Yeah, so it, it's tricky. I mean, time constraints in any clinic are going to make this challenging. And I think that's where nurses and nurse practitioners play a vital role is we are primarily patient facing and clinical focused. You know, I'm not running a lab or, you know, um, writing research papers outside of the clinic. And so I do tend to have the time to revisit these conversations over and over again. And so often we find when a patient comes in and has a treatment discussion with the physician, especially in this day and age where we're throwing a bunch of different options at them and, um, you know, having them factor in all of those factors of schedule and efficacy and duration on treatment, um, it can be overwhelming and they'll miss half the information that's been stated at them. So I'll follow up with a phone call and um, see how much they've digested and, and revisit some of those conversations. And often this comes with multiple phone calls or multiple visits coming back to the office before, um, you know, they're really able to, to make a decision and, and I'm able to allow, to listen to what their goals are and hopefully help steer them in the direction that's going to make them most successful, both emotionally, physically, and sort of overall beneficial to their health. Yeah, so that's really useful. Well, I think uh, we could go on talking all night uh, if we wanted to, and uh, but I think at this point we probably just uh, need to draw uh, this to a bit of a close. So at this point, I just want to thank all three of you for your great contributions, to thank you for your great discussion on these topics. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for participating in this activity. I'd ask you to please continue on to, on to answer the questions that follow as well as to complete the evaluations. And it's really all about listening to you, the audience, as well as to our patients. So thank you very much.